time to rock and roll. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Reboot completed. And with that, let's move on to Gen 2. So, and now to piss off some even more fans. Because that's just what I love doing here. It's my specialty. Gold, silver, and crystal. Let's see how the gen that added the best type, the type that was over nerfed into absurdity, and the best mechanic of special defense actually fares with regards to the game's difficulty. This game actually did introduce a lot of things, but let's see if it actually did impact the main story. And just to set the ground rules here, since Crystal is so similar in every way, the only difference is actually levels of some fights being slightly higher as in one level, and even that it is some movesets are not changed, we are not going to be considering Crystal a whole separate game. The reason we did that with Yellow is because teams were drastically different. In this game, teams are not different at all, and the only difference majorly is Yuzian, who you fight once. So again, not including. I can't even say that here. All right, we begin with Faulkner, and he is a joke. Not strong Pokemon at all. Sure, Pidgeot Pidgeotto's Gust this early might still be pretty good, but its stats really aren't that much above even base form starters. A decent ish move, but again, the problem is it just is so heavily outstatted. Bugsy up next actually does ramp things up. Sure, Kakuna and Metapod are fairly weak, but Scyther is exceptionally strong with its amazing base stats for this point. Nothing really comes close to this thing, actually, nothing even does come close to this thing. Outside of using rock types, or if you well, you're using Cyndaquil, and even against them, it's still pretty good. It doesn't mess around. It can take it decently well, and it can dish out the punishment exceptionally so. Just be glad it didn't have Technician. And now on to Whitney, the one who is the bane of every Johtoite's existence. Miltank is, for many of the same reasons as Bugsy's Scizor, a monster. This thing is... Completely devastating! There are very few, if any, fighting type moves available by this point, and even though rock types actually can handle rock and grinders can actually handle it very well, it's still a pretty bulky Pokemon, and with Milk Drink, it can restore its health very quickly, very easily, and still dish out a lot of brutal punishment. So even then, it's not really a golden bolt that kills it permanently. You'll just delay the you can really prolong the fight. But, it can still fight a pretty prolonged fight well as well. Again, it also is pretty fast. You know, that's the other thing, is Miltank is actually really, really fast. So this thing will get first strike. However, Morty is where things actually do start to get a lot easier. This is because no Levitate exists yet. Ghost-type moves are physical. Boy moves are also physical. So, it's... His Gengars are pretty knee- his Gengar line is pretty kneecapped, and really the only thing they can damage you with is Curse, and if they can land sleep, that's really all they can do. Even excluding the Dig TM that you actually get access to back in the National Park, it's not like he's a pretty hard fight because, again, his team does not have great moves, and their best way of damaging you is cutting their own health in half. You know, even so much as just avoiding getting slept, which is not too terribly hard because of its poor accuracy. He's not- he doesn't have anything that's a threat. He's- he's really not. However, Chuck does indeed bring the pain with his Mind Reader Dynamic Punch Polymath, which is actually very respectably bulky by this point, and Surf. It's not a bad Pokémon. Though it is important to remember that Polymath does not have the greatest of special attacks, nor speed, and Primates, Fury Swipes, they really aren't good for anything that's not neutrally hit by fighting. It's strong when it comes to using its fighting moves, but outside that, not really. You know, it is a fight that can go either way, but pretty much 
if Dynamic Punch lands, that's where things will start going either way. And he also does only have two Pokemon. So not, not really the greatest right there. Jasmine, however, up next, she's the one with the steel defenses. Ironclad, even though the Dig TM does exist, Steelix is a bit of a monster. Though her Magnemite do not really enjoy the fact that Dig does exist. They're bulky, but they're not bulky enough for a quad weakness if you can exploit it. But, again, they're decently bulky for not using that. It actually is a bit difficult because they do actually have the most resistances of any Pokemon typing in the series. It's very, very fantastic. Very few things can actually neutrally hit them. And, unless you can, I mean, if you're hitting them for weakness, they're probably going to go down anyway. But, outside of that, they really don't take much damage. Which is why they're actually pretty strong. And Steelix is a monster, physically speaking, and even its special defense, despite being its weak point, isn't terrible. It can at least soak up a decent special hit. Because remember, you don't have fully evolved starters by this point. So, that is an important thing to consider. It's got an okay attack, but Iron Tail, even though it isn't the strongest move, it's also not the most accurate. I mean, it is actually a very strong move, however, it's just not coming off of the best of attack stats. It's a decent threat, but also not the most imposing of things. It's good, but not stellar, and that's really the best way to look at it. Though a Thunderbolt from those Magnemite will hurt. They may not be the fastest, they may not be super bulky, but they can soak at least a hit up, and if they can return with a Thunderbolt, they will do some solid damage, because that, again, is a pretty good move. However, price is where things go back onto easy street with regards to gym leaders. Dugong's moves are extremely poor, and Peloswine isn't really a special attacker. It has an okay-ish one for stab, but it's still pathetically weak. It's it, it it's not even okay. It's just weak. It's just weak. At the same time, his whole team is weak to a number of typings. Especially that pile of one, which has a lot of weaknesses. And even though it does have a good amount of HP, its defenses are not exactly stellar. So it's again, it's an HP sponge, with not really the most amount of HP to back up those defenses. Plus they also all lack secondary stabs. But, Claire. Claire is last but not least. She is where the pain goes from tolerable to downright unfair. Outside of Icy Wind from Price, her three Dragonair are incredibly strong. This is because there is no other access to those moves beforehand. You know, unless you're using an Ice type, you're not going to have any Ice moves to fight these things. And there's no Dragon types you can use aside from your own Kingdra. Yeah. She's mean. And even then, Kingdra isn't going to learn Dragon moves. He doesn't learn Dragon Breath. <laughs> Not by level up. They are packing Thunder Wave, Dragon Breath, Slam, and either Surf, Thunderbolt, or Ice Beam. All of those, aside from Slam, are solid moves coming from Dragonair. Even if it's not the strongest thing in terms of even that's kind of poor stats, those are not really terrible moves when you don't have a weakness. And then is the Kingdra. Surf, Hyper Beam, Dragon Breath, and Smoke Screen. This thing isn't weak to ice, so even that Icy Wind isn't going to help you, and it has solid stats across the board. This thing is a ruthless, face-blasting monster, and if it gets off enough Smoke Screen, which it can reliably do because it does have extremely solid bulk, you're not going to have an easy time of taking this thing because it can just avoid moves. And then just pelt you with high-powered moves. You know, sure, Dragon Breath isn't exactly strong, but Surf really is. It's a really strong move. You know, taking this thing down, even in the modern day, is kind of an undertaking. And it's why Kingdra has remained a pretty solid Pokemon throughout all of the gens. The next gyms we'll actually look at later, because again, post-game, they're a separate thing altogether. And, surprisingly, unlike Team Rocket's iteration, the Johto branch of Rocket does actually have admins. And, 
we'll be looking over the executives because they actually are something that does exist, unlike before, where it was just Giovanni. The first one in Mahogany Town is... Yeah, there's nothing much to them. There's there's really nothing much to them. Outside of a Eradicate with Hyperfang, and maybe if they have their coffin go self-destruct detonate, they're not a threat by this point. Stats have really curbed them, and they're just... They don't really stand much of a threat to you. They're just not that great. But even then, if coughing does go for the self-destruct, it's a trade-off KO. You basically, it KOs itself to KO you, and again, it's his last Pokemon. It's nothing good. However, later on in the same location, you actually have a second battle, and despite having more evolved Pokemon, they still don't have good moves, with Air with the Arbok being the biggest threat. Next, in the Goldenrod Radio Tower, it does have many, and... First one up is using a lone Golbat, which, unsurprisingly, is not good. You know, lone Golbat on an admin team. Not a good Pokemon. Not not a good Pokemon. The second, however, of the polar opposite has six coughing. No. Again, they can all go boom, but Smokescreen Toxic Stall, it can be a threat. But again, it's trade KOs. You know, again, they do have some stall tactics, but again, coughing is not great by this point. Its stats are so heavily outstatted, it's just nothing. And again, self-destruct, trade KOs. Not really a good thing. And even then, Smokescreen also isn't really the best thing in the world. It's not great, especially when it comes to admin battles. Like... Again, evasion tactics don't really work that well. It's kind of a good thing unless you have, unless you have like a supreme bulk like that Kingdra. Evasion tactics don't really work well. The rematch with the female Rock Executive is actually surprisingly easier than the previous one. This is because at the levels we are at now, Poison Sting and Acid and, and just Nightshades set damage, they're just... Terrible. They've fallen off so massively relative to everything else, they just can't keep up. And that's kind of the big problem all of these things have, is their stats are just too poor. With all of them fell, we move on to the final executive, the Omega Executive, and... What a shock. They're a joke. Houndour is weak. Coughing is weak, as we've gone over. And Houndoom can be more of a threat, if it didn't have Ember as the only fire move. However, Fain Attack is not terrible coming off, it's kind of okay, it's pretty good special attack, but that's, again, still 60 base power stab for this point in the game. Uh, does... There's so much wrong, so much no. However, with the Rockets defeated, we can actually move on to our rival. The only teams until Ecrotic, all the Pokemon are weak. I'm just going to post them up right here so you guys can see them. Not great at all. However, Ecrotic is actually where things get a little more interesting. Magnemite and Stab on the starters do pack a light punch, but that is about it. However, when you go to the underground in Goldenrod, then we start getting to evolve starters. Fully evolved, except for Quilava. And even with five Pokemon, unlike with Jasmine's Magnemite, this one is not really a threat. And unsurprisingly, Sneal is a joke. But again, the, the evolved starters with Fralligator and Meganium are actually quite solid for this point, and Quilava is not bad, but again, one Pokemon really can't carry the whole team. His, his teams are just not good. With the entry to Victory Road, he's adopted a pretty decent Kadabra. The fully evolved starters now are pretty good, and a defensively pretty strong Magneton is actually not a bad thing. They are moderately difficult, but again, everything else is still not great. It really does hold him back. Up next, the Elite Four and Will is indeed a spike, because... He's got some pretty good moves. All Psychic-types, all packing the very potent Psychic. 
with some modest special attacks all around. They do pack a punch. Again, Egg Bomb and Body Slam from Executor or Slowbro, they can hurt, and Jinx Ice Punch is also very strong. It is no joke whatsoever. They're... they're pretty solid. The force actually gotten a little better since then. It only took them, what, like three years? Koga? It... no. No. Abort, abort. With spikes, confusion, and evasion toxic stall tactics. Supersonic, protect. Minimize, double team to execute all of these. This doesn't actually hold up as well considering. Because again, the evasion tactics to a degree do work. However, the amount of time you need to spend setting them up actually is a problem. And in a story mode, they don't really work as well. In a, in a main, in a competitive scene where people are using status moves more heavily, you know, stealth rock, things like that, sure, they can work. Because, well, they're not attacking you in return. When we have slower Pokemon that are also not exactly sturdy, and they're not using things like Minimize, and they're not regaining their health passively, it doesn't really work as well. Because again, a stray move here, stray move there, before they get into the point where they get a net benefit, they're vulnerable and they're functionally doing nothing. It really doesn't go super well. You know, it takes at least two turns for Minimize, and three at minimum for Double Team to really start seeing a net benefit. That's when they can safely start evasion boosting. That's when it becomes actually more reliable you miss than hit. And because of how long these fights, and because of actually not how long, how short these fights can actually be because they're frail stats, and also because they are slow, you can easily get in a good couple of hits before they get to this point and take them down that way. Because it's just three turns. Do your four turns. You know, three turns to use, minimize twice, then toxic. Then four minimum, double team toxic. It's not practical whatsoever. And it doesn't work well. The spikes, however, is actually pretty, is actually quite solid. It is a good thing, but again, that's the one solid thing this team actually has to look for it. Bruno is only a marginal improvement from Kanto, but Champ's got a better move in Rock Slide and Mach Punch for his Hitmonchan, and the better cross shop that Machamp does now have, it can put some decent dents in teams. But then again, the rest of his team is not exactly stellar. Karen has now replaced Agatha, and she is actually more threatening. Umbreon is indeed a solid brick wall. She's a Petal Dancing Vile Plume, which even though Petal Dance is not really that strong, it's one of the better moves we've seen in this game. She has a Destiny Bond Gengar, which can indeed be a menace, using its frailty and high speed to its advantage by allowing it to be instantly KO'd and then drop you with it. Again, her Gengar even manages to skirt the physical special split not having happened yet, with both Ghost and Poison being physical here, by having Spite and Curse, it pretty much uses itself as a tech set rather than an actual outright damage aggressive set. It's pretty interesting and actually quite clever, especially a way to get, again, it is a way to get around that physical special plot not having happened and Gengar's damage outright being kneecapped, instead of finding auxiliary ways to deal damage and actually hinder the opponent. It's actually a pretty solid team. However, last but certainly not least is Lance himself. Three, Dragonite. Even with Outrage being special in this generation, the one that has it certainly is nothing to joke at. Even coming from its, you know, it doesn't have as high of a special attack as it does physical, but that is a brutally powerful move. Especially considering this thing is outstatting you by a mile, because against a pseudo-legendary, and you can't have your own by this point. First of all, even if you could get one, even if you, have, even if you have a Tratini, it's not going to have evolved by this point, because the level. Two of them having Thunder Wave, one of them having the Brutal Fire Blast for all those Ice and Steel types that actually would counter it decently well, Blizzard and Thunder on the other two? These things are hardly pushovers. You know, Twister on two of them, they're not that great, but again, the other moves certainly pack a huge punch, and its Titanic bulk really is nothing to joke at. Not at all. And, of course, to supplement all this, they all have Hyper Beam. So even if they don't have the most powerful dragon moves, they've still got Hyper Beam to deal out mass damage like crazy. His Gyarados, on the other hand, really isn't as much of that outside of its very powerful Hyper Beam, since it no longer has that amazing special stat of 100, now downgraded to a 60 base, which is 
Yeah, it hurts. Yeah, Hyper Beam is still very powerful, but it doesn't have as much Titanic bulk as Dragonite, and it doesn't outstat as heavily as Dragonite in the same capacities. An illegal Aerodactyl that has Rock Slide. It did not get this move in this generation. It hurts pretty hard. It's very fast. It doesn't have the greatest of physical attacks, and it isn't especially bulky, but Stab Rock Slide isn't bad. It's it's not bad. And again, it also has the standby of Hyper Beam to increase its damage against things that might resist rock. Charizard's Flamethrower adds a good amount of punch, or, well, pulse in this case, because it's, it's range, not physical, but, yeah. His Charizard having Flamethrower just adds more fuel to the ice-melting monstrosities he has. Even with a pretty moderate physical attack, Hyper Beam is still a very powerful move. It's not going to be the most powerful thing in the world, but it certainly can do some damage. He has really stepped up his game since Kanto. It really does show. Again, takes a couple of years, but they learn. However, no, 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 we are not finished just yet. We still have all of Kanto to actually go over, as the gym leaders of Kanto are now our post-game content. We still have more to do, even with the badge boost. Leading off the Kanto leaders this time is actually Lieutenant Surge. And he's definitely packing some electric potential. Only if speed was all that mattered. His best attacking set is Magneton's respectable 120, but it is handicapped by only having Zap Cannon, as well as now the badge boosts, of course, are all in your possession. And even though it is decently bulky and has a very good defensive typing, it's still pretty slow. And again, Zap Cannon is terrible. Electabuzz and Raichu are only slight threats, provided, el provided that Electro does go boom on you, it can do something, but they're really not that strong. Sabrina is up next in Saffron City, where she just doesn't do well at three, po at three Pokemon. It's She's certainly no Will. Will at least has five Pokemon, and they're not all terrible. Hers just having three. They're... not great. Normally, you know, two of them are actually very quite competent, but, again, only with three of them, they don't really hold up well. Especially now that the special defense stat does exist, their huge special bulk is no longer a thing they can hide behind and really soak up hits, because a lot of the better moves were special. They can't really hide behind that anymore. Dece uh, Erica actually does benefit from these changes, having a pretty universally decent team. They've got at least modest attack power and some decent tech moves. She even has the triple threat combination of Sunny Day, Solar Beam, and Synthesis to really pack a punch while having sustain. She's not exactly a challenge. It's a good combination idea, but it's a it's not really a challenge, mostly because, well, they're boosting fire types, and even though they are pretty modest stats and pretty decent attacking power, it still isn't enough by this point. But it's a decent effort and actually pretty not terrible strategy. Janine, who I always want to accidentally call a Jamie. However, continuing the diet version of the Elite Four that Sabrina started, she's just a worse version of her father, Koga, having some similar ideas to him in Poison Stalling, but not as good tech as he did, and even his not great tech still is better than hers. Now, even now packing actually the stronger Sludge Bomb, her team is extremely weak. Sludge Bomb is really the only thing she has again that is a decent threat, and it's the only thing that actually has above 60 power outside of the Kamikaze Explosion Weezing has. You know, it's just like Lieutenant Surge, they like swap trainer tips or something like that when they were pairing their teams. No clue. Cerulean City's Misty is actually quite decent, kitted out with some pretty strong water moves in Surf, and finally, a decent move on Starmie. Lapras has stellar bulk, and Quagsire actually has great profile of defensive effectiveness, with actually the pretty good Earthquake, so she at least has some decent ways of dealing with the typical counters for water types. It's not great, but at least it's a good effort. It is a pretty decent effort. Rockin' and rollin' over to Pewter City, we've got, of course, Brock. 
where things immediately spiral down to being not a threat anymore. Universally poor special defense on all of his Pokemon, even though Amina and Kabutops have decent dam take decent neutral damage from water moves, everything on his team has four times weaknesses. And the other part on top of that is they're not all fully evolved. Is it too much to ask for fully evolved Pokemon by this point? I guess it is. I guess it is too much to ask. At least they have decent moves. It's kind of an effort, but even then, the best stabs that they... They're not really the best. They have decent stabs, but the Pokemon themselves are just not great. Blaine is still smoldering quite well. With a Thunder Punch on Magmar, it's a nice idea, but it's just too weak by this point. Sunny Day, however, does actually pose a little bit of threat for water types, ne neutralizing their moves and also making them take super effective damage. Again, Magmar doesn't have the greatest of stats all around, and the badge boosts do come into play here. Smog, Curse, and Rock Slide on Marcargo doesn't seem terrible, but it is quite slow, keep in mind, and it's not really helping, it's not the best special defense. Again, cute idea, but the Pokémon just don't really have the ability to pull these things off. Rapidash is... not great. At least it has Fire Blast, so if it hits, it might do some damage, but... Fire Spin? Really? Last up is the former champion, Blue. Or actually, Green, depending on which version of the game you play, because in English it's Blue, and in Japan it's Green. It's weird how it works. But, wow! It only took him three years to actually get a good team! Or at least a good for his standards. He still got Pidgeot, so... That's what I mean. But again, it's it's, it, it's an improvement on the team. So it could still use some improving, but hey, you can't teach all idiots. He's got a pretty box standard Alakazam for what we've seen so far, and just Alakazam in general. Pretty decent ride on, actually. Especially considering those are moves that the Rye family and even many rock and ground types still do use to these days. Even with other moves having been added, they still hold on to these moves. Gyarados is pretty weak, as we've already been over since the specials change. Executor does have some decent tech moves. And a little bit of power, actually. Not terrible, but not great. However, Arcanine having some pretty good stab, and actually the priority extreme speed. It's not the best team, not by far, but it is decently balanced, and it does show that he has improved, and he has learned from his defeats as numerous as they have been. But why is it so weak? Well, this is also because, again, the badge boosts are absolutely ridiculous. The thing you gotta remember about the badge boosts is you can't just directly look at the base stats of Pokemon, magnify them by 12.5%. Base stats don't work that way. You actually have to look at the true stats of the Pokemon, add the multiplicat multiplicative factor to them, then back calculate the stats from there. And in every single case of this, the base stat increases don't far exceed the, you know, things. It's not like, you know, oh, well, it's, you know, you increase by like 5%, you know, you increase it by like 50% and it's a triple. No. It is always greater than the multiplic multiplicative factor of a boost on the base stats. So, you're pretty much at this point running around with, if you have Pokemon of... If you're running around with Pokemon of about base 200, uh, about base 520 stats, you're pretty much running around with pseudo legendaries by this point. At least considering the stats of later games, that's one of the reasons why a lot of these teams are not as powerful as they kind of look to be in later games. Because again, a lot of things that have you know even 530 stats, they're pretty much on par with pseudo legendaries, and even in a lot of cases better than pseudo-legendary stats, just because of the way the base stats work out. If Blue's team by this point isn't a threat, then one chance does the rival have, especially considering those badge boosts? That's a good question, but the answer is, he's actually got no chance. Even fully evolved, Gengar, Alakazam, and the whole of his team just don't have good moves. They're all pretty much garbage. Even his starter only has a 60 or less 
base power stab by this point, or 80 or less non-stab. With the rematch at the Indigo Plateau, after that Mount Moon fight, again, the team is just bad. Almost everything is exactly the same, save for Thunder now being on Magneton over Thundershock. Even Crobat can't help that much. Now that the arrival is over and done with, we can actually move on to Mount Silver, where our final challenge awaits in Red, the strongest trainer. Except, not really. Pikachu is a joke. Espeon is a pretty strong and fast psychic attacker, but it's nothing we haven't already seen from Alakazam, who is really not that great. Even all the starters being fully evolved and having pretty decent stabs, they don't do much by this point. As again, we've been over the stat boost from the badges. You know, outside of the badge boost's damage, both of stats and typings, he's just a joke. Even the normally very formidable Snorlax just really can't keep up. Snorlax's bulk really serves well when the opponent can't really damage it especially well. Being able to do a ludicrous amount of damage means it can't outwall you, which is kind of its one big thing. You know, level advantage was pretty much the only thing Red ever had, because people would pretty much would not fight him at even level because they just didn't want to be bothered doing it. With that removed off the table, his stats are terrible in how they show, and he really just can't do much to you. He is the epitome of an illusion of challenge based on level disadvantage. But, all things considered, even with the badge boosts, the other badge boosts with the typings. I also forgot to mention this one thing about the badges. The badges in... Now that we have all the, the gems done. One thing about all the badges in uh, Johto, aside from the dark type, the bat, because there's no dark type gem, all of the badges grant a 10% boost to moves of that type's power. So for beating Falconer, you have a 10% boost to flying type moves damage and so on and so forth. Pair that up with the badge boost. Again, this is what I mean when I say everything is punching at above the power of pseudo-legendaries. These things just can't compete. You know, before you actually took on Lance, things kind of could compete. And that was because a lot of the better move typings actually are in Kanto. And, you know, just kind of how easy everything seemed towards later on, it actually is a step up from Generation 1. And here's the interesting reason why. It's because the first eight gym badge types aren't really that strong and really don't have good moves even accessible to you or not even really strong typings. You know, Bug, not great. Ice, pretty much nothing has access to these because again, Ice Beam is not a TM that's been introduced yet. You know, dragon, you basically, you can't use Dragon types pretty much. They basically don't exist outside of Dragon, which you can't use before fighting Lance. You know, there's no, no, the move typings that predominantly are known for being the stronger, like fire, grass, water, electric, those simply are not accessible until the end of the game. So you don't have those really, really powerful typing boosts until actually the game is over with. Even with the badge stat boosts, you don't have the power boost, so you're not at full capacity, pretty much, before fighting the gym leaders and the Elite Four and Lance. And that's actually where the challenge does come in. The gym leaders here, because of course the, the special defense, special attack split, and just other things, actually do pose a bit more of a challenge here, because they do have better moves, again, compared to Generation 1. And that's really where the things lie in. These gym leaders actually do pose a little bit more of a challenge, and even though the admins aren't particularly great for Team Rocket, they're actually still better than what Giovanni had. Remember, Giovanni, until it came to yellow version, and even in yellow version, he didn't exactly have the best stabs. This, you know, a, a 30, 40 base power stab from something like a Houndoom is still better than a, like, 15 power stab. You know, Bugsy and Whitney both actually have stellar Pokemon for the point in the games they're at. These are far more powerful than anything seen in the entirety of Kanto, of, of, well, red, blue, yellow, red, blue, green, and yellow, except for maybe Raichu and even then. 
because you actually do fight Raichu at a pretty late point in the game, you will have evolved starters by that point. You'll have evolved Pokemon, but that Pokemon will actually be further evolved. When you're fighting Bugsy, you don't have that luxury, even going against, you know, Whitney. There's pretty much nothing in the game, even outside of rock and ground types, which don't really do all that much to her because she can kind of outwall them as well. It's basically a battle of attrition against her. There's nothing like that when it comes to Jo... 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 jo, jo Kanto. And again, Lance is a monster. Karen has pretty decent Pokemon. You know, Will, not terrible. Even if we're disregarding the entirety of postgame, which postgame in pretty much is a colossal joke, it's not the easiest... It, I wouldn't say it's not the easiest thing in the world, but it definitely puts up more of a fight. And let's also not forget the monster that is Claire's Kingdra. Nothing in the entirety of Kanto even comes close to this thing. And yet, same of Lance. Nothing in Kanto even comes close to these things. So yes, the ruling is, GSC is harder than its predecessor of Kanto. Not the predecessor of Yellow version, because Yellow is actually harder than the original games. So, well, the trend of difficult games actually is what we're finding. The games do get a little bit more difficult. Even if it isn't by much, the difficulty is increasing gradually. Well, relatively speaking. So, um, whether or not... Actually, no, we're, we're going to be ending the video here because Gen 3 is going to be big. So I will see you guys next time, where we continue on to Home Sweet Hoenn.